Good morning, everyone, to those of you who are in the room and also those who are joining us virtually. My name is Gemma Molinos. I'm the chair of the Young Academy of Europe, and it is my absolute pleasure to present today the 2021 Andre Mischke Young Academy of Europe Prize for Science and Policy. This year's prize has been awarded to the scientific director of the Interuniversity Microelectronic Center, IMEC and group leader at the MICAS, which stands for Microelectronics and Sensors Laboratories of the Department of Electrical Engineering of the Catholic University of Leuven, Belgium, Professor Marianne Verhelst. This is in recognition of her internationally leading academic research, management and policy making. Now, before we get Marianne to the stage and she can give her lecture, I would like to please ask for the laudatio uh, given by Dr. Arild Husby from Uppsala University in Sweden, also board member of the YAE until very recently. Uh, if we could hear the laudatio, please. Thank you. The Young Academy of Europe started in 2012 as a bottom-up initiative by a young group of recognized European scholars with a passion for science, science policy, and how to best support young scholars. One of the aims of the Young Academy of Europe was to set up a prize recognizing outstanding achievements and contributions by early to mid-career professionals that support and promote science and evidence-based science policy, science communication, and more generally support future generations of scientists and scholars in Europe. It is therefore my pleasure to welcome Professor Marianne Verhelst from the Department of Electrical and Engineering at KU Leuven in Belgium as recipient of the 2021 Young Academy of Europe Prize. Professor Verhelst is a distinguished scholar within her field where she has focused specifically on low power processing architectures for sensing and embedding learning for Internet of Things devices. For her successes in research, she has received numerous awards, prizes, fellowships and grants this includes the Laureate of the National Academy of Sciences and Arts in Belgium, an ERC starting grant, a Fellow of the European Laboratory for Learning and Intelligence System, and an IEEE Distinguished Lectureship. Professor Verhels has been involved in many different organizations, but I would particularly like to highlight her engagement in the enhancement of science literacy and to increase the uptake in STEM studies as a member of the Flemish STEM platform. Marianne was also a founding member of the Belgium Young Academy, where she served on the board and as co-president for two years, working on issues such as the need to improve possibilities, work-life balance, and the science landscape for early career researchers. She is also passionate about science communication and outreach, especially towards the younger generation, and founded the Innovation Lab in 2014, which developed design engineering projects for secondary schools. This initiative has so far trained over 600 teachers who in turn have executed the projects with more than 12,000 students. Marianne also features regularly on popular science TV shows and on podcasts in her home country and has been involved in the creation of a citizen science portal. She was chosen for the 2020 to 2022 Science Meets Parliament program and initiated and organizes the Women in Circuits initiative in the IEEE Solid State Circuit Society for mentoring young female chip researchers. So please join me in welcoming Marianne to receive the 2021 Andre Mischke Young Academy of Europe Prize for Science and Policy, which will be handed over by the Young Academy of Europe Chair, Dr. Gemma Modinos. Um, so before we get uh, Marianne up here, uh, she will give, uh, she will, when she gets up, she will give her lecture entitled Pursuing Tech Sovereignty for the EU, a researcher's perspective on how to join forces with local industry policymakers, and the general public. This is a monetary prize, it's our most prestigious prize. It comes with a beautiful medal and a certificate. And it is my pleasure, Marianne, to award you the certificate today. So join me, please, and congratulate you, Marianne. Thank you. 
Yeah. Okay. So I'm very, very grateful. And, and the reason I'm that grateful is not just because I get a prize, but because I can get this prize. Because this Andrei Mischke Prize for the Young Academy of Europe is not just about being a good scientist or about being a good researcher. I like the type or this prize because it is a very holistic prize in my view. It is about research and, and science, but it's also about doing something on policy making with that knowledge. And it's also about science communication. And these are three things that are very close to my heart because I think as a scientist, yes, we are gaining knowledge and we are trying to learn new things and understand the world better, but we are especially as a scientist sharing that knowledge, sharing that knowledge with others to move the world forward jointly, step by step, by all collaborating on this goal. And that means I have to share knowledge within all these different buckets I put. I have to share knowledge with my peers, which is my real research, but I also have to, say, to share knowledge with decision makers to make them do better policy making. And I have to share knowledge with everyone else around me, the whole society, which is the science communication part. So what I wanna do in this lecture is show you a bit in each of the buckets, what I try to do and what I think are important things to do in my field of research then. So let's start by this field that I'm in. So I'm a microelectronics uh, professor, which means that I make chips, computer chips, these teeny tiny specks of silicon, eh? often just a fingernail in size, which do computing. Um, and I specifically make chips or processors for AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and processors optimized to do these kind of workloads. And these things become more and more important in our life. And you might think I'm not doing AI, but to be honest, every one of us is using it every single day. Everything you do on your phone or many things you do on your phone, whether it's uh, finding your route to go somewhere or doing a Google search or doing a speech command or, or unlocking your phone with your face or some augmented reality app from Ikea or whatever, these are all AI workloads we use every single day. Of course, in my research, we try to push this to new applications, um, more in the health sciences or, 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 or yeah different applications, but already now you are using AI a lot. And this is at your, this power is at your fingertips in the devices you carry with you. Okay, this phone seems a bit a black box. Where is this AI then running? What, what is Marianne then developing? Well, we would have to break open the phone. So I brought an iPhone here that we broke open and there's lots of components, the screen, the battery, the coil to charge it wirelessly and so on. But what I care about as a microelectronics person is just this tiny board that I circled in red. And if you would zoom in on this board, a lot of stuff is plastic and whatever, some uh, less important components. But again, what I care about is a box that's in the middle, small metal box, and that box is the chip, the application processor of your phone. Every single thing you run on your phone, your all your apps and your screen interface and, and all your intelligence runs on this small chip of a few centimeters large, it seems. But in reality, it's even smaller because this box is just a box. If you would scrape it open, you would damage the chip, but inside you would see there is even a smaller thing. That thing is actually the silicon chip, probably about half a centimeter by half a centimeter. And that does all the compute that your phone has to do. Okay, but what does it mean? How can it do all this computer? Well, if I would zoom in on this half centimeter by half centimeter chip, you would not see anything because it's too small, these electronics to really see something. But on this chip, there are billions of transistors, 10 billion transistors, let's say, and they all open and close and this allows them to compute. We're not gonna go into too much detail on this, but together they form computer, computers, little computers, processors, things that can take instructions from a program, let's say your Excel sheet or your email program, they take instructions from this program and they execute them. And I don't have one such processor or little computer on this chip, I have many. Because you see here, CPUs, two big CPUs, four small CPUs. So this Apple phone has six regular processors, 
to do whatever general purpose programs. But you also have here, one, two, three, four, four GPUs. These are processors optimized to do all kinds of graphics things. Uh, render your videos, send things to your screen, deal with your camera images, and so on. But since a couple of years, there is an extra type of processor also on this uh, half centimeter by half centimeter only. Eh? Another thing here, it's called NPU. Well, this NPU is called the Neural Processing Unit. It's a special processor on almost all of our phones today that is optimized to do AI processing, machine learning processing. Typically today, these are deep learning or deep neural networks, maybe some keywords you have heard about. Well, it turns out all these artificial intelligence or machine learning workloads are so compute heavy, they need a separate processor to run them very fast in real time with very small battery consumption. I said only a couple of years ago this was added. This is a very recent trend. Interestingly enough, over the last couple of years, five years or so, everyone started to design their own NPU, neural processing unit. NVIDIA has their optimized processors for this. It's in Huawei phones, Samsung, Apple, but also Intel, Baidu, Google, and so on. Every company is really working in this space to make better neural processing units for consumer devices and other applications. Now, as a hardware designer, I say, okay, fine. And we have a new type of processor. All the hardware companies want to make a new processor. Okay. But there is something else going on. And that, that's very, I think, weird for me as a hardware person to see this is that it's not only the hardware companies, the traditional hardware companies like Intel and Huawei and so on that are making these chips for AI. But there's also traditional software and even application companies that never ever made a chip in their complete lifetime of the company, maybe for 60 years. And now they made their chip because they need a better chip for AI processing. A good example is Tesla, it's a car maker, but they're making their own chip to run their AI workloads. Or Amazon or Facebook, who thought Facebook would make computer chips? They do for the AI products. And the reason they start to do this is that because these software companies see that the hardware to run these AI algorithms is so important in their consumer um, experience, in their speeds, their performances, that this is their key differentiator. And they make their own chips, they don't share it with anyone else. So remember this AI chips as market differentiation, we will come back to this in a couple slides. Now this seems all interesting and great and the market is flourishing and we have new chips and so on. But at the same time, you also heard in the last two years that the chip industry is suffering. We have a chip shortage, that the car makers cannot make new cars because we lack chips. Apple has to cut iPhone production because it's missing chips. There seems to be a storm going on in this chip world. So what is this? What is going on there? And I wanna look with you to two things that causing, are causing this because we were all happy. Eh? We were making new AI processors and this is the revenue of the chip markets over the last decades and it's going up, 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 up. This market seems to be booming. And yet we have this problem now. Is it just this COVID pandemic that came and caused a big problem? Well, not really. Yes, COVID has to do with it, but it was just the last drop in the bucket that started the problem. But something was going on already or is going on for a much longer time. And it starts with two important reasons. And the first one is our fabrication capacity for these chips. And that stems from the cost of making fabs, eh, fabrication houses to actually fabricate the chips. And what you see here is how much it costs to build one factory for making chips in billions of dollars. And on the X axis, so the different bars is for different generations of chip technology. So 65 nanometer or kind of very big chips from the, that we made in the past. They don't use the smallest, uh, latest advances. And this is the size of one transistor. And you see they can make transistors smaller and smaller and smaller. They become faster, lower energy for my battery, but much more expensive to make. And to build one new factory now with state-of-the-art technology costs me about five to 10 billion euros. Of course, if it's so expensive to build a factory, it's a big investment. 
And the result is that the time to pay off this investment, what you see on the x-axis, that time until the investment of this factory breaks even, becomes multiple years, especially, and as the y-axis, it's a function of how good is this fab, uh, this factory utilized? Am I running it at 100% of capacity or am I only filling it for 60%? You can see that you have to fill your manufacturing capabilities very high. And even then, I still need several years until this thing pays off. With these new technologies, they come up every two years. So after six years, my factories break even, but it's already an old factory by then. You see, it's a bit better. These are the different colors in, in countries that do big government um, subsidies. In Asia, for example, this is very common. Otherwise, it's even harder to have a break even. The result of this is that, of course, everyone only builds a factory if you're sure it's going to be full or almost full. Otherwise, it's not worth it. So we only build factories if we really, really need them, meaning that there is no buffer in our fabrication capacity. Worldwide, there is hardly any buffer in manufacturing capabilities or capacity that we can play with. And the result is that any drop that falls that causes some rise in demand is a disaster because we cannot scale up. There is simply no fabrication capacity for that. And one of these drops here in this case was COVID because we all stayed home. We bought more laptops and headphones and all kinds of electronic equipment. At the same time, the blockchain and, and Bitcoin mining rose and these two extra demands, there was no capacity. And everyone suffered. Car chips couldn't be made anymore and now iPhones and so on and so on. So this is the first reason of what was happening. The second reason has to do with where these fabrications sites are. Where are the chip manufacturing fabs? Well, you can see they're a bit worldwide. We have some in US, we have some in Europe. We have a lot of them in China. And especially the biggest ones and the more advanced ones with these five nanometer and so on, they're mostly in China in a very small geographic region, which is both environmentally and also sometimes politically not that stable. And this is what you can see if we plot across the different years, what manufacturing capacity or we use in Europe. Europe is yellow, United States is pink, everything else is Asia. So more than 70% of our chips are fabricated in Asia worldwide. And Europe only does about 10% of the world's chips manufacturing. Manufacturing, yeah, we take off more. Our car industry takes a lot of chips, but we don't make them here. And that is the second reason. For example, there were some bigger COVID issues here in Asia and some water shortage in Taiwan and so on. Okay, this hits a big part of the manufacturing capacity and we're in trouble. So it's both a combination of not having enough capacity and having it too geographically centralized. Now, remember what I said, that all these companies, even the Tesla and the Facebook and so on, they see the chips as the key market differentiator. Think this now together with this geographic bad spread and the shortage in capacity. This is a very sharp contrast. Oops. So, okay, this is the situation where we're in. This is the knowledge I have from my research background, what to do about it, right? What can policymakers do? Of course, Europe is very well aware of this problem. Uh, and some time ago, they launched something called the CHIP Act, European CHIP Act which tries to increase chip research and production capacity in Europe. And Thierry Breton then added that we really want to develop high capacity chip production plants inside Europe. And we want to be able to build, and it's in the bottom here, chips of two nanometer of below. This is again, this transistor size, and that fab will maybe cost $15 billion, whatever. Very big investments. Will it pay off? Will take time. So I want to react to this with two statements or call to actions. First of all, this statement seems to focus a lot on just being able to make the chips, fabricate them. But this means someone also has to design them. It's like building a house. It's nice that someone can build my house, but I need an architect to make the drawings of the house. This development, chip development cycle, the design we call it is important too. And once the chip is made, 
someone has to do something with it. If it's a chip for a smartphone, we have to integrate it in a smartphone. We have to build applications on top of it and so on. These kind of capabilities we are missing in Europe as well. We don't have smartphone makers. Um, and if we want to mean something, there is more than just building the fab. Then the problem is not solved. And it means we need tight networks across the stack from the, 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 the designers of the chips to the makers, to the integrators, to actually really become successful in this area, not just build the fab. And a good example of this where it's already happening is what we call the imaging valley. It's the region around Belgium and Netherlands where there's a lot of companies around camera chips, eh? like the camera in your smartphone, but both the technology developers, the chip uh, designers for these kind of chips, the makers or the factories for these kind of chips, and the software writers, the integrators, everyone is closely together in one network. We need more of these kind of networks and invest across the stack, not just in building a fabrication house. And we have to do it more pan-European. This is too small in terms of location, of course. The second thing I think is, it's not, I'm not sure that building the two nanometer, super expensive, very fancy technology factory is the best decision. Uh, it will be very expensive, but also it's not really investing where Europe is already strong or where Europe has the right expertise and background. And to state that what you see here is what chips we consume in Europe, in our companies. We see a very big size of car chips, chips that go into car that we buy. And this is not just for the European market, but worldwide. Europe is a very big car manufacturing house. It has um, Mercedes and, and Volvo and so Audi and so on. We have very big car makers in Europe and we see in 2019, 4% of the car was the cost that goes to chips. In 2025, it will already be 12%. So chips are very important in this market. Europe is already strong here. Europe is also strong in chips for manufacturing. So basically chips that monitor production processes in, in um, all kinds of manufacturing environments. We are not doing a lot of laptops and smartphones and consumer device creation and chips for that. Uh, a bit for cell phones and so on, but okay. You see, we are good here. This is the embedded electronics market, the internet of things, embedding electronics into consumer goods, everyday devices. Europe is very good there, but you don't need two nanometer chips for these applications. These applications often run with a bit older factories, but they care about different things. They care about rapid time to market, modular design, IP, custom IPs for specific markets. Again, it's not just building this fab. It, this is about the whole ecosystem around it. And that is an investment that will pay off more in those markets. So we have to think of where we are strong and try to stay strong there rather than trying to get into this very different area by just putting a 20 or 10 billion factory. Okay. Um, that's about policy making. And then I, I want to end with what's maybe even closest to my heart. And that is, you see this market is evolving so fast. All these chips are coming up and the AI and the machine learning. And sometimes it even goes a bit too fast. How do we make sure everyone is on board? Because if we want to do this and, and make Europe tech sovereign and, and be strong in the tech world against Asia, against the United States and so on, we need enough skilled workers. And we have to make sure everyone can ride the wave and no one is left behind. So this is all about education. Education will be key if we want to move forward and stay of importance. We have to train talents in the fields of STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And unfortunately, Europe is not on the rise in that sense. And again, I brought some data, but these are the different years. On the vertical axis is how many thousands of bachelor degrees do we award in science and engineering. And you see Europe was always on the high side, even in the 2000s, we were doing pretty well, but obviously China is launching, but even the United States is kind of catching up with us. So we need more investments here. At the moment, only about 50 diplomas per thousand inhabitants in Europe go to STEM degrees in tertiary education. 
Belgium, that's my home country, is one of the worst. So what is happening here? Eh? Let's try to understand what's happening before we can do something about it. How can we enthuse people better? Well, my personal opinion is that it's a problem of a leaking, or it's not my personal opinion. The observation is that there is a leaking STEM pipeline. We have a lot of kids interested in science in, in primary school. We still have quite some kids picking science in middle school. In high school, it's already a bit less. And then they go to university, it's a bit less. And then the masters and the PhDs is again less. Every time we lose a bit of the population continuing in STEM education, especially girls. This is a map of Europe that shows in colors how much percent of female people are STEM graduates. And again, you see many countries are dark red. So what's going on here? Why are Europeans not that interested in STEM and especially these girls? If you ask me, it's a matter of relevance. The relevance of how we perceive the relevance of science and technology. And I will use some statistics from the Rose study here, a very interesting study that was performed across many countries. And first thing, we'll start by something positive. They asked youngsters, so this was a big survey on youngsters, and they asked youngsters, do you want a future job where you help other people? And what you see here are different countries. Maybe it's a bit small, I'm sorry. The red dots is always the answers of the girls. The blue dots are the answers of the boys. The bottom countries are the more wealthy countries. Eh, you'll find France and, and Switzerland and, and Austria and so on, Iceland, Finland. The top ones are the more poor countries, as Zimbabwe, Uganda, Ghana, and so on. What do you see? In general, people want a job that helps other people in their future, especially girls a bit more than boys. And interestingly enough, in a poor country, people care more about helping their peers that are in trouble than in our wealthy countries. Okay, for the girls, the difference is less big. Girls wanna help out on average. Yeah? Then the other question in the same study to the same kids was, I would like to get a job in technology. Interesting split again between the more Unwealthy, poor countries, yes, I want a job in technology. The wealthier countries, nah, maybe. The boys, yeah. The girls, no, I don't need a job in technology. Question is, of course, is there a link between these two? Can I use technology to help other people? Well, they asked questions like that. And this is one example. Can science and technology solve environmental problems? Ha, huh. these underdeveloped, or underdeveloped not, but less wealthy countries that like to help other people, that like to get a job in technology, they see the link. I want to study science and technology. I can help other people with this. And yes, there is a link. These more wealthy countries, they don't see the link. You cannot use science to get a better environment and solve environmental problems, especially the girls. They don't see the link. Maybe it's not weird that they then don't study technology if they wanna help other people, right? So I think that's a key thing. We have to prove there is a relevance for science that for example, a doctor is a hero, a doctor saves lives. He helps someone else to not die. But an engineer and a scientist is a hero as well because he's the engineer, he's a scientist that develops equipment to analyze the patients, to cure the patients of their cancer and so on. They're also heroes but they're much more hidden. You don't see these heroes. Maybe they're even heroes at a larger scale because they built one equipment and thousands of doctors can use it. So it's a bit my personal mission to try to spread these words. And I think we should all, if you're active in science and engineering and so on. And to me, it's not about science communication. I don't have to educate people or it's not my primary goal, but I wanna enthuse people about science. Science is relevant. Science matters, science helps us forward and it will make our future life better, more agreeable, it will save people's life. And I try to do different initiatives in this uh, sense and the Laudas you already mentioned, we have some podcasts every month, I have some appearances on national TV, I give lectures to kids, but there is one initiative that is very close to my heart and with that I want to end my lecture. And that is Innovation Lab. 
In Innovation Lab, it's a project from a, or an initiative from KU Leuven that I'm uh, leading. We try to make engineering challenges that are executed in high school. And they always start from a societal problem and they link this to science and engineering you need to solve it. And the students actually solve it. And to make it specific, this is Sophie. Sophie is a little girl and she has ALS. She not, cannot control her limbs very well anymore. She's shaking her hands and her legs and so on. But she has still pretty good control over her face. She can look to the right, to the left, and she wants to stay in touch with her friends. I mean, she's a teenager, who wouldn't? So she wants to use her computer to chat and to play games online and so on. Question to the students is, can you build something where Stu Sophie can control her computer by just moving her eyes? It's with the biopotentials of your eyes that you can measure. And so we measure biopotentials, you convert it to currents, voltages, then digitize it, send it to your computer. It's possible if you know enough science. So in one day, they build all of this. They start to learn the biology of biopotentials. They send it, I mean, they measure these small potential differences, study the physics, build some electronics, plug it in the USB port of their computer and then program with some informatics an interface for Sophie. In one day, they have seen that they make someone's life, a very specific person, Sophie, better by using science they see at high school and try to make this link. So we have about six projects like this. Um, we don't go to the schools because we think the teachers are the role models of the kids and we couldn't handle the scale. So we teach the teachers and we give them all the equipment needed to do these kind of projects. And so far it has run in 150 schools with 600 plus teachers for 30,000 Flemish students. Um, so it's one way I think how we can show and convince people that science, yeah, it's about gaining knowledge, but it's especially about together moving the world forward to make a brighter future. And I think if we can all share that, we can change the European landscape in the coming years. Thank you.